Welcome. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family, and we are delighted that you have welcomed us into your home. We certainly would love to hear from you, so send us an email with a question or a comment to jimandjoy at EWTN.com. Well, today our guest is Andrea Jo Rogers, and she is a Catholic author, a physical therapist, and a volunteer EMT. And she's written several books available at her website, andreajorogers.com. And we're excited to have her on. Absolutely. She's a Jersey girl. And um, so we're going to hear all of her stories. And there are many. She's been that woman for 35 years as a volunteer. And she uh, signed up as a when she was in high school. And so she's been there a long time. And she's got many stories to tell. Well, first, um, over the weekend, one of our granddaughters, Rebecca and Nathan's sixth child, Gloria Camille Wright, she made her first communion mm. at the cathedral at St. Paul's in downtown Birmingham. And there is beautiful Gloria, as sweet as she could be. It was a beautiful day. Uh, I cry. I cry at communions. I cry at confirmations. I cry at baptisms. It, I just love the power of the sacraments and all that they do to the souls of us all. And that's uh, Rebecca's beautiful family all eight of them, and that is you and I with glory. At we our had, cathedral. In at Paul's our cathedral, cathedral yeah. Birmingham. And Father Jerebek did a great job. It was a beautiful day, and there were um, there About was a 21. large group, yeah, yeah, a large group of kids that came in. Like the first communion. And it was so, so moving, so beautiful, so hopeful. It was just that kind of day. You know, you have all these different days, but it was a day that we felt so triumphant mm -hmm. because you knew God was going to act yes. because it's a sacrament. Mm -hmm. You know, God was going to show up. He was going to do what he was going to do, unite himself to these young children, and hopefully they will give response all the days of their lives in, in welcoming the Lord to, to come into them mm -hmm. through the most holy Eucharist. When I saw... Uh, Gloria Camille walking down. She looked just like a bride. Mm, she looked just like a bride. I, I thought to myself, you know, you're getting older. I might not see her get married, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're not promised you're going to be there. But I said, you know, I see her this day as a bride. And I told her, remember, you're dressed as a bride because you're marrying Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He's your first groom. Yes. You understand? You know that? And, uh, and that's beautiful. And so your husband will need to know that too. You're married to Jesus first. And you got a, got a guy who you know, understands that. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to see her that night um, <laughs> afterwards when her mother and I went out and she was still glowing. She looked so beautiful. And, and we all should always remember the first day that we received the sacrament mm. of the Eucharist inside our own bodies. Let us never forget the power of the sacraments of the Eucharist and all that God does to us and through us. And what an intimate union. And it was, uh, for me, it was another child full <laughs> um, there. It was, it was just beautiful. Wonderful. And it was a beautiful day. So, so God bless Gloria. Andrea Jo Rogers is here with us speaking about being an EMT and over 9,000 encounters that she's had at that critical moment in the midst of life and death. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Please don't go away. Welcome back. You're at home with Jim and Joy. And our guest today is Andrea Jo Rogers. She is a Catholic author, a physical therapist, and a volunteer emergency medical technician. She's written several books, and they're available at her website, andreajorogers.com. Well, Andrea, we're excited to have you on at home. And Thank we you. want you first to tell our family a little bit about yourself and then how and why did you volunteer and get involved at being an EMT? So I'm a physical therapist and I'm happily married to my husband, Rick. We have twins, Lily and Thomas, mm -hmm. who are 16 years old. 
and I've been a volunteer with the Spring Lake First Aid Squad in New Jersey since high school. Mm -hmm. And during my years with the squad, I've witnessed some amazing things. So you were 16 when you started? Yes, so I was working in our town's beach office selling beach badges. And one of Which the is important in New yes. Jersey at the Jersey Shore. <laughs> Summer job, right? One of the few states that make you uh, pay for beach badges. That's another story. <laughs> and one of the beach cops came in and he asked me to join the first aid squad as a cadet. And I said, no, absolutely not. I, I was very busy and I didn't know anything about first aid. And so I told him, I'm sorry, I, I'm going into my senior year of high school. I'm in a lot of clubs. I run track. But for every reason I gave not to join the squad, he countered with a reason that I should join. So eventually I joined because I couldn't think of a good enough reason not to join to satisfy him. And I've been answering calls ever since. Bless your heart. Well, you've, you've come so far down the road from that time, and God works in mysterious ways because you call what you do a vocation. So that says to me somebody who understands what's going on here, but we don't start that way oftentimes. You know, God is so gracious to get us involved and we're not even sure why we're doing what we're doing. But you call it a vocation. You feel that it's, it's a real calling to be there. Unpack that for us, why you use that term. So I think that um, I was called to be an EMT uh, and it's funny because sometimes you don't necessarily realize that that's going to be the path that you take. But for whatever reason, I did join the squad and it changed the career, uh, my whole career path, mm -hmm. because I went to William & Mary thinking that I was going to go into business. And instead, I became a physical therapist, which then intertwined with the being a volunteer EMT. The two kind of go really nicely together. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, I'm able to help other people, which is what I really enjoy. Yeah. So both those care those careers that you do, even though one is volunteer and, and the other one is paid, they really do run parallel to each they parallel, other. And sometimes and they, they assist, intersect because right? sometimes the patients that I take to the hospital as a volunteer, I then treat as a physical therapist. Wow, mm -hmm. that's amazing. So what happens you, when you were at home and you were a cadet when you started? being in a volunteer, which kind of you would think in this day and age, nothing would be volunteer, right? But it's Spring Lake, New Jersey, and mm -hmm. so it's a small community. Yes. And so you have a volunteer squad that shows up. So how to sh take us through that journey. You're sitting at home watching TV, and all of a sudden, what happens? So uh, we wear pagers. So the pager goes off, drop what you're doing. We go directly to the first aid building, and we get the ambulance. And then we take the ambulance to the scene and help the person. Uh, if the call is close to our house, like if you have to drive directly by to get to the building, then we would go directly to the scene instead. Speak okay. to us about the makeup of the group. So, so I, like I was asking you earlier in the show, you're an EMT, emergency medical technician, are there paramedics? Who's the team made up of? What are their roles? So our squad is made up of about 30 to 35 members. And they range in age all the way from 16. In fact, my twins just joined a few yeah. months ago, so they're our youngest right. members. Yeah. And we have members all the way up into their 80s and a uh, very active squad, lots of, we have about a thousand calls per year. And it's really a team effort. It takes everyone doing their part to make it all come together. We have assigned crew nights, so from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., we definitely have members who are have yeah. to respond, mm -hmm. so you know it's your night. Yeah, this, uh, you know, I've been pondering this in preparation to, to have you on, and it's not something I must admit I pondered a lot. You know, uh, th this response from emergency medical technicians, paramedics, and but it's profound. Mm -hmm. I, I I was served in that way during my heart attack and had people come to me, people who I don't know, people I didn't really want to be with. I'd rather my family be with me, but all of a sudden here we are so intimately entwined, and I really didn't even know what was happening you know, to me, I just know I had this pain. Um, and I've also heard that most people who are about to die don't even know they're gonna die. They're thinking it's something else. I was thinking of something, what's going on? Right. So here we are, I don't know these people, I don't know you, you're here, but God, we believe from our you know, Catholic faith, Christian standpoint, somehow God's here we are, in all the years that I've lived, all the days that I've had, everything else, all of a sudden these strange people 
And so it is a vocation, it is a calling, right. it's a sacred space and sacred place. So I can see why, I know you can unpack this, yeah. your children want to be involved with this and why other people, I'm hoping that we're going to get some people that become paramedics or emergency medical technicians. Yeah. To me, it's a really noble thing. And I think that during my years with the squad, I've just been able to witness some amazing things. Some, and that's why I began writing the books to, uh, to try to share those with yeah. others. Some of them are miracles. Some of the stories are sad, but faith-filled. A few of them are just funny. Mm -hmm. But my hope was that people would be comforted by the stories or inspired by the stories and that they would perhaps relate to something in their own life. Mm -hmm. And just to know like they're not alone. Whatever you're going through, mm -hmm. God is with you. And whether it's to miraculously save you or to lead you home to him, mm -hmm. he's there. Yeah. And so on a call, you're volunteering. How many people show up from your squad on any given call? Like, and who's in charge? How does that go down? It can really vary how many members are on the call. Anywhere, a minimum, bare minimum would be two. Mm -hmm. Usually, we like to roll with three or four. Okay. On a weekend, we might have 10, mm -hmm. yeah. even 12. So it can mm -hmm. really vary. But our set night crews have four mm -hmm. members. Anyone's always welcome. If you're awake and you want to go, you can go and help out mm -hmm. as well. Now, I, you have several books on this reality, and all of them seem to have something of heaven in it, <laughs> in your titles. And so you really, you really believe that somehow, some way, you know, heaven, the transcendent, somehow is there, somehow is present there. Um, you can unpack that in a minute. But tell, when I read some of the stories, you know, that you have in, in your latest book that will be coming out that I got to kind of read some, what information do you have when you're going to this site? Because I do see like a dispatch. Do you get the information or who gets the information? Because you, you know, you're hearing person not breathing, somebody's doing CPR, accident, vehicle, somebody's hit somebody, or, uh, something has so slipped, accidents. Our initial dispatch will, it, our uh, pager has a voice. So the dispatcher will say uh, the location of the call and the nature of the call. And sometimes we don't know the nature. It's unknown. Someone calls 911 and hangs up or, you know, if when they learn more information, if only a minute's passed, they'll re-dispatch the call and give us an update. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you're there, how does it work in, if you know that the person is about to die? Right? And there's a situation. And yes. how, what is your journey? I mean, we had an incident of a car wreck on our front yard. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I can remember saying across the yard, just stay with me. You know, it's going to be okay. You know, and you're just trying to assure them that the, before there. the ambulance even got there. And, so you know, that those conversations. One, I can relate that to one story. So we had a crew call one night. And it was a woman who was about 80 years old, and the call was dispatched for a person with difficulty breathing. And when I got there, she was sitting on her sofa. She was bent forward. You could see the anxiety on her face. Mm. She was struggling to get the air in. And as we helped her from her sofa to our stretcher, she grabbed hold of one of our members' arms, and she said, I need to get a priest right away. Mm. And our police officer, are, we are very fortunate in our town. We have a wonderful police department, many of whom are EMTs as well. Mm -hmm. And one of them said, I'm going to call the rectory right now. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to have Father meet us at the it's hospital. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, she said, we helped her onto the stretcher, and she said, I'm never going to see my house again. And I said, please don't say that. We're taking you to the hospital. Mm -hmm. They're going to be able to help you. And she said, you know what, I, I, we were already rolling her towards mm -hmm. the front door and she said, I need my rosaries. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, where are they? I'll get them for you. And she said, they're on my dresser in my bedroom. So before we could even get them, she unbuckled her seatbelt. She's walking to her bedroom and I'm trailing uh -huh. behind with the oxygen <laughs> tank. And you know, one of our members is saying, you really shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. we, we'll do it for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. But um, when she got back on the stretcher, that anxiety was gone. She had mm. wrapped the rosaries around her hand, she had kissed them, and she had a serene calmness about her. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, wow, the, the rosaries are really helping. Mm -hmm. And we got as far as the threshold to the door, and one of our members said, oh my gosh, she, the patient said, deliver me, Lord. She was gone, she mm -hmm. lost her pulse. 
And you know, I checked, I said, mm -hmm. begin CPR. Mm -hmm. And so we began working on her. We got her into the ambulance. Uh, the paramedics were not available. They are the paid uh, paramedics who respond from the hospital. But we were doing CPR and um, we got a faint pulse back. And so I thought, oh, thank goodness. Um, she still was unconscious. She wasn't breathing, but she had a pulse. And we got her to the hospital and we uh, transferred care over. The doctor was waiting for us with the nurses, the respiratory mm -hmm. therapist. And when I left the room, our father was in the hallway um, mm -hmm. from our parish. And I said, oh, let me show you where she is. Um, so I brought her, him back into the room and he stood at her head and I watched as he anointed her. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, I am witnessing such a profoundly blessed mm -hmm. moment in her life. Yeah. And um, yes. We went back to our building. About a half hour later, a police officer stopped by and he said, I have some really sad news. Um, she had a, a massive heart attack after you left. And um, mm -hmm. so at first I, I felt terrible because we like to save everybody. Mm -hmm. But then I thought, well, at least she left earth with such faith mm -hmm. and such um, belief and she got her, her wish was to be anointed. Right. And so by resuscitating her, even if it was briefly, mm -hmm. she was able to be anointed yes. and then pass on. And that is absolutely so, beautiful. Um, I, I had mentioned that many people like myself don't know how critical they are. So lots of people die without knowing what's going on. Here's somebody who it sounds like knew her mm -hmm. timetable, yeah. you know, so that's mm -hmm. totally opposite of what I'm saying and many people right. experience. She kind of knew that, and you're trying to comfort her and say, hey, you know, we're doing okay here, you know. Mm -hmm. But she, and, and it came out just the way she said, and yeah. that is beautiful, because that's mm -hmm. the greatest healing, even though it's not a physical healing, but she probably died in a beautiful state of grace to right. be with the Lord. That's powerful. That share, I don't know if that's, well, it's miraculous in a sense, but yeah, have you seen? Yeah, we do have true miracles, <laughs> well, that, too, on okay. a more, you got some of those? <laughs> sure, on a more upbeat um, okay. note. Well, first of all, one of the miracles is um, how I began writing. Uh, okay. So I was inspired to begin writing after my son and I were involved in a terrible elevator accident. And the accident made me step back and I took a close look at my life, thought about my relationship with God, my family, my friends, my hopes and my dreams. And one of my dreams was to write. So the accident um, actually was what inspired me to write. And I write about it in the first chapter of my first book because after I was done the book, I thought it needed something to tie it all together. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, in the books, I changed the name of our town and all the people to, you know, yeah. keep their privacy. Right. Yes. Now, but, and Andrea, what do you hope to accomplish with your books? Like, so you're writing these books. For me, I love these kinds of books. It's like the Reader's Digest, yeah. the story. It's hope. It's healing. It's real life. Um, even even if say. someone is unto death. I mean, to have um, an angel like you, a human being like you come up and assist and bring comfort in their passing. I mean, what a beautiful passage and what a presence, um, and it is a vocation to bring what you bring. I, I want people to know that miracles exist mm -hmm. and I've seen them. And I'll give you an example of one. So one day, um, it was a beautiful summer day. This is actually before I was a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working as a beach cop and uh, a 12 year old girl was digging a hole on the beach. She was there with her grandfather and she had been digging the hole all morning. And at a certain, there was a group of volleyball players further down the beach. And at a certain point, one of them thought, something seems different. Like what's different? And then she realized, you know, that hole is gone. The one where the yeah. little girl was digging. So she went over to the grandfather and she said, excuse me, where is that little girl who was digging the hole? Oh. And he said, yeah, obviously kind of frightened. He said, I, I'm not sure. She was there four or five minutes ago. And she said, well, where do you think she is and how? And he said, well, maybe she went to the bathroom. Maybe she went to get ice cream. And she said, well, would she really leave you without telling you? And he said, I, I don't know. So then the volleyball player went to the lifeguards and said, call 911. I think there might be a girl buried somewhere mm -hmm. underneath the sand. And we estimated it could have been anywhere in a 15 foot radius because they weren't exactly sure mm -hmm. where the hole was. Mm -hmm. So she and the other volleyball player started digging and the lifeguards started digging and they sent another lifeguard up to the concession stand to see mm -hmm. if they could find her. Mm -hmm. So 
I was, I just gotten back from lunch. I was riding my bike on the mm -hmm. boardwalk, my, mm -hmm. you know, police bike. And my first aid pager went off and it went off as a person buried alive. Mm. And I thought, person buried alive? Like, how is that even possible? How mm. could you, how could that happen at the beach? Well, when I got there, there was already a crowd forming. I started, um, my boss said, there might be a girl under mm -hmm. here somewhere, start digging. Mm -hmm. So we were all digging, digging, digging. And I remember just praying, please let us find her if, mm -hmm. if she's even under the mm -hmm. sand. The minutes ticked by, one minute, two minutes, mm -hmm. three minutes. We kept digging. The lifeguard came back. He said, she's not at the concession stand. Keep digging. Four minutes, five minutes. And I thought, my goodness, if we find her, she could have brain damage. Mm -hmm. She could, mm -hmm. you know, who knows? Um, she could have aspirated. So at, after a couple more minutes, I heard a man say, I, I think I see something. And he had uncovered her hair, the very top of her head. So we kept digging. We dug out her head. Mm -hmm. She was perfectly blue and her mouth was filled with sand. And someone scooped the sand out of her mouth and then we were digging out the rest of her body mm -hmm. and as we pulled her out of the sand, all of a sudden she came to her eyes snapped open and she took a deep breath wow. and I thought. That's unusual. It is a <laughs> miracle. <laughs> a miracle that the volleyball player noticed mm. that so many people could pull together, mm -hmm. bystanders, mm -hmm. players, lifeguards, mm -hmm. police, first aid, to find her and uh, we took her to the hospital and she was um, sent home the next day. Mm -hmm. She was perfectly fine. fine. Andrea, we're gonna have to stop there and look forward to some more stories again tomorrow. Thank you for your great and awesome work. We'll be right back. There's plenty more to come. Please don't go away. Welcome back. We're at home with Jim and Joy, and this is the part of our show where Father Patrick comes to us. Father, we're so excited to have you. What did you think of what Andre was sharing? It's it's a wonderful privilege that she mm -hmm. has to be in this, as she mentioned, and you, you talked about this vocation, this calling from God um, to be with people at these um, critical moments in their lives. And the one that really hit me, they're both very powerful stories mm -hmm. he talked about toward the end, but the first one in particular with the elderly lady um, it, it did really strike me that um, even though the Lord was calling her uh, to himself, that she was able to witness just the, the faith in action and just mm -hmm. how God's grace transformed someone who was clearly, as she mentioned, when they got there, she's full of anxiety and just mm -hmm. couldn't, was struggling breathing. But then like when the faith, the grace kicked in, where are my rosaries? And she saw that she was at peace and deliver me, Lord. Um, it just reminds me when even you know, as a priest, you know, we get to be with people also around death. Um, I remember my first or second year of priesthood, I was able to spend some time with a woman who was dying from cancer, especially the last couple of weeks of her life. And I remember the last day before she died in the hospital, she said to me from her hospital bed, she said, nothing in this life gives me any pleasure anymore. I just want to be with Jesus. Mm. Like she was at peace mm. and she was ready for the Lord. And I think this vocation that Andrea has um, again, she can, that she can share these stories to increase our faith, to inspire us, to be ready, to remind us that we're just on a pilgrimage here and that heaven is home, you mm -hmm. know, to be ready. We thank God for the graces he gives us. That we want to live our life to the full and be ready when he calls us. It's yes. beautiful, Father. Thank you, Father. Why don't you close us in a, in a prayer for our people who have had all sorts of experiences, near-death experiences, or been with loved ones who are dying, and just God's comfort to be with them and those who may have passed on sure, in sure. a final blessing. Sure. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We ask for your blessing upon us. We pray for the blessed repose of the souls of our loved ones who have gone before us. And please prepare our hearts that we might always be ready for you and keep our eyes fixed on you and on heaven. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with and your spirit. spirit. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, Father. You, Father. Pray this show has been an encouragement to you, especially as we ponder our last moments in this world, whenever that might happen, maybe by surprise it happens. God's never surprised. And God's always trying to reach us and to affirm our lives 
and even at those last moments to, to cry out to him and, and trust our souls into his care and to, to hope and to pray he'll have the right people around us mm. at that time. You're an important part of this family. You're never alone. You're always at home with Jim and with Joy. Bye now.